Hello, everyone. Welcome to Screenwalks. My name is Marco Demutis. I work as digital curator at Photo Museum Winterthur. Screenwalks is a collaborative program initiated by the Photographers Gallery in London and Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland with support by Pro Helvetia. This series of fortnightly live streamed events was created as a joint effort by both institutions to continue the investigation on the changing role of photography in its digital and networked forms. Every screenwalk is led by an artist, a curator, or a researcher, or a combination of those, performing guided explorations of the places where their core practice takes place. Invited participants take the audience through different online spaces and networked images, from obscure platforms to popular websites seen through the eyes and screens of our guests, from drone vision to satellite images, no screenwalk is ever the same. So artists, uh, researchers, and curators are invited and encouraged to play within the prop with the properties of the live stream as well as the possibilities of screen sharing. If this is your first screenwalk, please make sure to visit our website, screenwalks.com, to check the recordings of all our previous events. So for those of you in Zoom, your microphone should be muted. If not, please go ahead and mute it now. This event is being recorded and we will be archived, so please turn off your camera if you don't want to be recorded. Feel free to send questions to me or John privately or in the public chat in Zoom. And we'll bring your question to our guests. Hello, everyone from my side too. I'm John Uriarte, curator of digital programs at the Photographers Gallery uh, here in London. Um, today, we are going to question how the earth has been traditionally represented uh, in order to explore other ways of looking and imagining it. Open Weather's Sophie Dyer and Sasha Engelman, along with a global network of collaborators and Rectangle Design Studio, uh, will share with us their latest project, an alternative photograph of the Earth and its weather systems. Just four days ago, on the first day of the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, a network of people around the world, from India to Argentina, Congo, Japan, among many other uh, locations, capture weather images, satellite weather images, using uh, do-it-yourself antennas, turning uh, into transmissions from three orbiting national oceanic and atmospheric administration satellites. Members of the network received the images and submitted them along with field notes, documentation, photographs, and other details of their locations. All these materials were sent to Open Weather, who, working along with the Rectangle, created the project when I image the Earth I imagine another. The resulting website offers a multi-layered, incomplete, diverse, and experimental image of the planet made of multiple perspectives and situated positions. Uh, this nowcast, as Open Weather calls it, uh, suggests an alternative image of the Earth in the times of a climate crisis, working from a feminist, open source, DIY, and global perspective, this impossible view of the planet questions previous monolithic representations that have occupied our collective Im uh, visual imagination of the planet, such as the blue marble. In a time in which the control of space exploration and its representation is in the hands of very few, very few government agencies and macho corporations, this project by the open weather community opens the possibility to other ways of making sense of the planet in which we all live. This project is part of a wider program of activities to coincide with the COP26 meeting that I previously mentioned that the Photographers Gallery has launched in partnership with Tabacalera, uh, the International Center of Contemporary Culture in Donostia, San Sebastián, Spain. Uh, and that's uh, all the introduction that I think that I have to do today. Uh, dear Open Weather, I'm really happy and excited to, to have you with, with us uh, today. Uh, the screen is yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see so many people here. We're open weather. I'm Sasha, and this is Sophie. Um, and we're super excited to share this new work that we've prepared for COP26. Um, it's been a huge effort. We're super happy with it. It involved 27 people around the world imaging the Earth on the same day. So it was a really collective effort. It, it kind of uh, required us to be um, awake uh, a lot over the last four days, uh, working across so many time zones. So you have to 
cut us some slack that we're a bit exhausted still uh, and just trying to hold our thoughts together. Um, see if we're happy, but it's just we haven't we haven't slept very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. Um, I think we're going to share screen soon and, and begin by actually showing you the work. Um, although I think it's best explored by you on your devices. Um, but but we'll kind of we'll do a bit of a tour and the format that we thought would work best is we're going to kind of briefly say, I guess, like who we are, who Open Weather is, um, the decisions and ideas behind the work, uh, which actually began in its conception through a conversation with John almost a year ago. And, and then we're going to cut to how we made the work practically and the logistics of coordinating um, what was essentially a kind of uh, a snapshot of the Earth from space uh, from many different angles. Um, and then uh, we know on the call that there are some of our collaborators here who operated ground stations on Sunday when we took the different Earth images. So we would then like to open up to our collaborators to, um, to reflect if they want on their, on their experience of participating and, and join the conversation and, and then leave plenty of time for questions. Sounds like a great plan. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna share the screen now and we'll go to the Nowcast. So I guess briefly about who we are. Um, I'm Sasha, I'm a geographer. Um, I have a lectureship in the Geo Humanities at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and I work at the intersection of uh, environmental sensing, community activism and contemporary art. And um, I'm also a radio amateur. My call sign is Mike Six India Oscar Romeo for any of the radio amateurs out there. Um, and uh, I've been part of Open Weather with Sophie for, um, yeah, I think since like late 2019, uh, but have collaborated with Sophie for much longer than that. Sophie? Thanks. Yeah, so I think for context, I can also say that, yeah, my background is in, in visual communication and design. But I actually work with satellite imagery um, on a day-to-day -day basis in a team at Amnesty International that responds to crises as they unfold around the world, often actually when our researchers can't get into the field. So remote sensing is a big part of my job, although I have, like Sasha, no training in it, um, but I, I work adjacent to it. And I'm also, importantly, uh, for this project, a radio amateur, which I guess is actually how our collaboration began through, yeah. through writing, but also the process of getting our licenses to be able to uh, transmit radio in the UK. So my call sign is M6NYX, which just also happens to be the Greek goddess of the night. So if he has a better call sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I think we can yeah. say that, you know, that's who we are. Open Weather is the name under which we work. It is also a project that has, um, and I think this is now hopefully more than just an ambition, become a community of collaborators. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that really came about through kind of, I guess, three areas of focus that we always envision for the work mm -hmm. that are the writing of critical frameworks, so concepts or lenses through which we understand what we do and why we do it. Um, also, the production and writing of how-to guides and, and the hosting of workshops, one of which is coming up at the Photographer's Gallery. Um, On uh, November 13th, 3 to 8 p.m., so uh, <laughs> watch out for that announcement, and you can um, sign up, and uh, it costs uh, 40 pounds 50 pounds, I think, 40 or 50 pounds, but there are also three free bursary places for those who can't afford to pay, but you have to write to the gallery to request a free place uh, to join the workshop. So those who want to join for free, please do write an email to the gallery. Okay, that was our workshop plug. <laughs> yeah, so critical frameworks, the guides, the workshops. workshops. Now I say we'll probably lump the guides and the workshops together into one bucket because what they have ultimately kind of helped us grow is a community of collaborators around the work. Yeah. So that's where we are with the project. There's now kind of several years in the making. Mm. And, and I think we should talk now briefly about the ideas and decisions behind um, the Nowcast that was produced in response to COP26. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So Open Weather is a feminist project. We have a set of feminist principles that we're always sort of using. We like to think of our feminist principles as if they were tools in a toolbox, so not as 
abstract theories or categories, but as actual tools. And we have something called the Open Mother Feminist Handbook online where we've kind of distilled our, our uh, principles, uh, but also said how they come into our concrete practice. So one of the kind of feminist ideas we're working with for this now cast was the idea of kind of critiquing the disembodied gaze um, kind of in the long line of thinking by feminist scholars, uh, by people like Donna Haraway um, on uh, kind of, um, you know, the, the harmful aspects of this God's eye trick. So seeing the earth from very far away, uh, seeing the earth as an object, um, seeing the earth as this like high res, almost like Christmas ball <laughs> ornament in the vacuum of space. There's a long line of feminist thinkers, obviously, that have thought a lot about that. And we see our contribution here as within that long lineage of feminist thinking. So our approach in this conversation has been to try to create a visual grammar for the earth or a kind of earth image that is polyperspectival. And by that, we mean from many angles. So as you can see, Sophie's kind of zooming around the now cast, you can see these like fragments or pieces of satellite imagery, almost like shards um, that are hovering over different parts of the equal earth map. And these pieces have been captured by individual people or groups of people in locations kind of in that region. Um, but there are also many gaps, many, many blank spaces, many places where no one uh, was there to image from a satellite. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to think through and work uh, around a kind of visual aesthetic so that's polyperspectival rather than totalizing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you have things to add that I forgot. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. I think that, um, I guess there are just two things that I add, but pretty, you said them in different ways already. I guess one is, the view from nowhere that yeah. you covered that is you know staying with donna haraway countering this this god's eye view and as john said when you know the talk began satellite ground stations are very much somewhere and operated by someone and staying with that kind of you know tradition of feminist thought understanding the knowledge that we produce is always being situated um and also partial so that kind of incomplete image was um, an, a noisy image too, was, was an, the kind of counter image that we wanted to produce to the kind of, I guess, what the artist Ingrid Barrington would call the forever noon on a cloudless day. That is the way that she describes our most common encounter with satellite imagery that is Google Earth's algorithmically smooth globe, where I'm sure as, as many of you know, um, for Google Earth, but also for some satellite imagery you purchase, Images are often multi-temporal, so stitched together to reveal the most land and sea so that clouds are effectively erased. And of course, what we're interested in this project is our lived experiences of, experience of, but also um, the different ways we represent weather and climate. So for us, kind of writing back into our Earth image, the noise of our environments, the clouds, the weather systems, the dust mm. was something that was really integral to the project. Yeah. And I would just add that, I guess for me as a geographer, it's very interesting how our work sort of builds upon the work of feminist geographers and geographical mm -hmm. information specialists of the early 2000s who were saying, you know, it's very sort of easy almost to say the image of the earth from space is this um, masculinist, positivist, totalizing image, but they said, actually, how can we use satellite imagery differently? How can we subvert satellite imagery? How can we subvert the tools of GIS to make them work for communities? Mm -hmm. And I think our work is very much in line with that kind of body of uh, thinking as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and <laughs> we can, I, th I think, but, so that's like, that was the kind of, that was the, the idea that we wanted to first communicate that was about the image from somewhere yeah. that is polyperspectival from many angles, and also when knitted together into this patchwork is also incomplete. Mm. So I guess the, the next sort of uh, feminist principle that was very important in this project was the idea of writing experience into remotely sensed imagery. So how could we make present that these images are created by individual people with particular DIY antennas 
in particular contexts and in, in, in certain radio environments, you know, kind of battling different kinds of noise and interference, using different kinds of methods to use their antenna, using their bodies in different ways. It's a very, it's a very embodied practice actually tracking a satellite with a radio antenna, especially if you use a certain kind of antenna. So this idea of writing experience into remotely sensed imagery was very important for us. And so to this end, when everybody submitted to the, uh, to the NowCast through our archive, they also submitted information on their ground station. So what kind of antenna they used, what kind of software they used, where they were, um, you know, um, any other notes on local um, kind of environmental conditions. They also um, sent other photographs of themselves using their ground station. So kind of like this one of Sophie when we were on the roof of the photographer's gallery on Sunday morning capturing NOAA 18. So we're trying again to kind of texture or inscribe within these remotely sensed images. Um, other kinds of metadata, I guess, on the um, lived context and experiences of people in the network. Maybe this is a moment actually so briefly also about how there's a lot written into these images. Yeah. As well as um, the metadata that we collected that kind of augments the images, there's noise in them. And you can see from our image in London that, uh, yeah, we, we had a failure of our dongle. <laughs> Uh, which is which is part of the kit that we use to see the image. Yeah. Um, and you can see that either side of the image is really noisy. So I don't know, Sash, do you think this is the moment to talk about perhaps the, the noise? Let's do it. Okay. So <laughs> actually we've got the antenna. Actually, maybe should I demonstrate? Yeah, but we're sharing screens, so we're gonna be tiny. It's okay, but, I'll just sort of show it a little bit. So so we stood to receive this image um, on, on the roof of the photographer's gallery. And um, and there were actually we were quite concerned that it would be noisy because of course as well as receiving the satellite image there's lots of other radio frequency interference that can that can kind of disrupt the image and and there were lots of actually extractor fans on the roof um, that would have been responsible for some of that noise but as well as radio frequency noise we when holding when the, with the particular antenna we use we we track the satellite so. Our movements are actually, you could say, written into the image in 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 static and noise. Mm. As if we are not tracking the satellite, which we do partly to um, compensate for the Doppler effect as the satellite moves over. Um, but yeah, we, we because of the in, the transmission is um, directional, um, we we actually kind of create noise in the image through moving and shifting position. Um, so there are multiple, I guess, registers. Um, on which noise is literally quite literally written into the image from our bodies, our environment. Um, and, and actually there was a one, one time we were doing, uh, we did a, a live uh, performance from, from our homes during the lockdown. And, and I at least found when I was standing barefoot on my metal kind of fire escape, that that, that, that again kind of really shifted um, the, the energy system that was, of course, you know, me, the antenna extending right up to the NOAA satellite that we're receiving. I don't know, Sasha, do you want to say a bit about the satellite? Uh, sure. So, um, but just to be clear, what Sophie was saying is that when she wasn't wearing shoes, so without the, you know, the cushion of her rubber soles between her feet and her metal balcony, that's what was kind of producing this uh, system of satellite re reception that she was just talking about. Um, in terms of the satellites themselves, um, yeah, so, so what we're really interested in is the transmissions of three National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, satellites. And these are US-operated satellites. They're part of a fleet that was uh, initially started in the 1960s um, and now has 20 satellites in it. Many of those have been turned off. They are in a graveyard orbit, so they are no longer transmitting. But there are three that are still transmitting, NOAA 15, NOAA 18, and NOAA 19. And the reason why we like these satellites is because they transmit images uh, in an analog fashion. So the image information is literally encoded in the physical radio wave that is coming to Earth. And I say this because a lot of satellites today transmit digital information. So they transmit digital kind of packets or envelopes of data through the radio spectrum. These satellites are actually encoding like, you know, grayscale pixel values from white to black 
in the height of waves of a carrier signal of a radio wave that's coming to us and receive our, our antenna. Now, the uh, mechanics of that and how exactly the satellite encodes the information is actually in a 2400 hertz carrier signal, how it then oscillates that using a frequency modulator and how that then gets transmitted on 137 megahertz, how we then extract that information, uh, get those amplitude heights out of the 2400 hertz carrier wave, how we then decode those amplitude heights into pixel grayscale values is a long process that we can talk about if there are questions. I'm really fascinated by it because I've uh, been really interested in um, how signal processing and satellite decoding works on the level of code, um, but I think we'll leave a longer explanation of that if there are more questions at the end. Yeah, and we yeah. can also, when we get to the how-to section, we can dec we'll decode an image yeah, for you. Yeah, we'll, we'll actually show you how that, how that works. Okay, so I guess <laughs> we've spoken about the, the kind of the polyperspectival situated image that we wanted to create in which we are literally writing um, interference into it through our bodies and, and also capturing uh, metadata um, that amplifies our lived experiences of weather and climate change. So, so those were the kind of the big ideas, I guess, behind the, the Nowcast. Um, and, th and there's one more that we wanted to share with you. Um, that I guess is why we chose to focus on, on weather mm -hmm. um, and how I guess we really got to um, the frame of the climate crisis through an exploration of weather um, and atmosphere and also more than meteorological weather that extends to our political and social environments. Yeah, and so I think um, when we kind of conceptualize this now cast, we were thinking about how could we use it as a platform to better understand how people differently understand weather and how they differently understand the climate crisis. Um, so we, we actually thought about like sending our favorite text on weather to the network beforehand and doing a reading group where we would all read the same text on weather and weathering, but then we thought that that would not be in line with our feminist thinking around um, like honoring people's original ideas of weather and climate change because we would be imposing Anglo-European -Euro uh, idea or set of ideas. So instead, we had a meeting with the network um, before the Nowcast happened with everybody uh, who was in kind of 13 core ground stations that we had selected. And we kind of brainstormed and defined weather and climate change from different angles and different perspectives and thought about how, how does someone in Kinshasa think about the weather? How does someone in Japan think about the weather? And we have this beautiful document with everybody's kind of definitions of, of weather and climate change. Um, and that was really kind of useful for our thinking. But then also when people submitted their images on Sunday, they also answered two short questions on uh, describe your experience of the weather while receiving the satellite transmission and where do you locate climate change in your local community or environment? Maybe that's a nice place for you to talk about who we selected in terms of ground stations. And I can, I, I can talk about there. the ground stations. Yeah. I also just wanted to add, because I realize there's one thing that we missed in this, okay. that is kind of present in the project that is of course this big tension of scale. Mm. Um, which hopefully um, comes through in all aspects of the documentation from the tension between the remote sensing images and, and these kind of um, like selfies that many pay people took, also um, images of, of where they, I think if I can skip to Joaquin's image of, of where they set up their antennas. Um, and also, I guess the tension and scale between our experience of the weather and this is one thing that we talked about on the call with our collaborators and our experiences of climate mm. and the climate crisis. Um, and there is something I think that is particularly beautiful when you're receiving a satellite image that is actually really hard to describe on this call. That is, there is this moment when you're standing there probably in the cold <laughs> here in the UK, maybe not if you're lucky enough to be in Argentina, um, and you're holding your antenna, although actually the one we're showing right now is the quadrupedia helix. So you don't hold it. So let's let's like get up. Uh, I you know, can go to we're... Allison in Glasgow. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. It's just down there. Okay. 
Allison, we know you're on the call. Yeah, Allison Sorry. is definitely here. So we're now spotlighting <laughs> Allison, who is here. We also <laughs> showed Joaquin Station. Um, yeah. yeah, so, so that's so just this moment, which is really beautiful, that we um, we kind of go through um, in workshops where where you're standing there and and you have, um, I guess, you know, you're kind of you're very much sensitized and tuned to the weather um, because you're standing outside for um you know about half an hour setting up and holding the antenna and then particularly if you're live decoding so you've hooked up your software defined radio to a live decoder an image starts to appear you have this almost kind of um i guess like uh, exploded sense of awareness in which you suddenly see in real time everything for hundreds of kilometers around you and you are smaller than the scale of a pixel. So there's this real kind of, I don't know, it's not a cognitive dissonance, dissonance. but yeah. it's it's um it's a it's a conflicting experience, I yeah. guess, in which you're really you're there exposed to the elements, but you're effectively looking down at yourself through a satellite image and seeing what is all around you. Mm. And it is an experience that simply does not compared to looking at the weather on a smartphone app, even a fantastic app like the web mm. Met Office app where you can see, you know, already pre-processed images that show yeah. rainfall based on pressure. This is something quite different. And as Sasha said, it's analog. So if you move, you know, it's static appears in the image. So you're really focusing too on like tuning to the sound of the satellite that will play you later, yeah. the appearance of the image and and the kind of the weather around you which might mean protecting your laptop yeah if it's raining and often you can you can see almost in in real time the noise that you are creating the noise in your radio environment any interference from nearby in the spectrum so you can really kind of see you can see yourself in this in this image which i think is quite unusual for looking at satellite images we don't often see ourselves um and so i think that's one of the really uh, alluring um, and powerful parts of the kind of satellite imagery that we work with, at least we like mm -hmm. to think so. <laughs> so okay. I think we can wrap up this section yeah. by briefly explaining kind of the logic of, of who, how we came to work with the, mm -hmm. the 27 collaborators. Yeah. Um, and then we'll move on to talking about practically how we built uh, the Nowcast. Mm. So <laughs> Sasha, fill me in if I miss anything, but I guess the should we already talk about the community or I would, or would we say perhaps perhaps we'll just briefly say before we go into into the kind of how the community came about yeah. um we chose a combination of um ground stations for the nowcast that practically many of whom already had to be set up with an antenna so many were um previous collaborators from past uh works that we uh, or projects um in the last two years as well as participants from workshops and um, there were also um, at least one or two people who we have never met, but we know that they have been on public lab where we wrote a guide for how to set up a DIY satellite ground station. And we have been in touch with them through the forum on public lab, and we knew that they were set up and receiving images. Mm -hmm. So practically, we needed that kind of critical mass of people who were there already um, with their ground stations what we wanted to do differently to what we did last year, because we did do uh, an outcast last year um, for our networks festival in Canada, but it was very much a kind of relatively spontaneous decision and experiment. Yeah. And, uh, and we didn't have any funding, so we couldn't also take people's time in the way that we did this time and that we, you know, we said, if you get involved, we really want you to take part in this call mm. in which we're going to think together through different definitions of the weather yeah. and our lived experience of weather and climate. Um, and then we also kind of, you know, we, we have an agreement that they will submit to the archive. So we knew um, we had 13 core ground stations that we knew would submit um, on Sunday. And the last thing I would say is that geographical spread yeah. and also a spread of experiences was really important. So we, um, with the, the, the budget we had for the production of the work, um, we could send out we sent out two antennas in the end two antennas, to, yeah. um, to two locations that we knew would not otherwise be imaged. So um, one antenna went to uh, Tasha Honey in Australia. So actually, I can just yeah. jump down to Australia. Um, and Tasha and her partner, Dean, have a small scale farm. 
Um, and we were really interested in connecting with somebody who was uh, very, had a different relationship to the land. Mm. Um, so, so we, um, yeah, we asked Tasha and Dean if they would be interested in taking part as farmers. Um, and, and we then work with Tasha to really, yeah, to, to get the antenna out to Australia. <laughs> from China and then to train them up in the software yeah. and the operation of the antenna. And then maybe Sasha, you can speak to Cedric and uh, So Kinshasa. yeah, another collaborator was Cedric uh, Chimbalanga um, in Kinshasa in the, in the Congo. And Cedric was a friend of people I had met on a residency in Germany last year. And um, Cedric uh, has a project called Biso Plastique, uh, and he's an artist and he makes work in a variety of formats. Uh, and so similarly, kind of like with Tasha, we worked with Cedric to get him set up with a DIY satellite ground station, which um, because of logistics actually meant kind of uh, getting our friends to take the antennas and all the kit with them when they were traveling to <laughs> Kinshasa. Uh, it also meant um, uh, me speaking in French um, because uh, Cedric only speaks French. I have never spoken French since I was in since I was 18 years old. <laughs> so doing satellite signal decoding in French was uh, was a, a big a big reach. Um, and people who were on the open weather call um, know that because at one point I had to simultaneously translate French to English in one of our calls. But um, but it was really really fantastic working with uh, Cedric and. Um, he ended up capturing a number of images, one of which Sophie is showing here, of the um, coastline of Africa and the Atlantic Ocean, and um, super happy that he was involved, and we hope to keep collaborating with Cedric in the future. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I guess the point, sorry, the point that Sophie was kind of, uh, I should kind of continue the, the thought, is that um, by selecting kind of 13 core ground stations, we were thinking about positionalities, where people are located, what kind of perspectives they had, um, you know, and how Cedric's perspective on weather and climate change is very different from Tasha's perspective, from Yasmin and Stuttgart, from Joaquin and Buenos Aires, from Zach in Seattle, from Bill in Virginia. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. everybody had a very different kind of placement and position. And that was very important for us in thinking through um, weather and climate for this for this project. Um, and there Sophie has put up some of the, uh, well, all of the um, ground stations. I guess also important to mention here that um, although we sort of worked with 13 people before the Nowcast, we also put out a call to the wider open weather network, which um, crazily enough now constitutes over 50 people operating their own ground stations around the world. During our last Nowcast in September 2020, there were only 13. So, um, I don't know how you feel about this, Sophie, but for me, it almost feels like an accidental growth or like it kind of has grown and expanded in ways that I certainly didn't anticipate, um, but has been really uh, beautiful to watch. And so we kind of emailed the 50 total people in the network and also invited anybody else who wanted to volunteer to participate in the Nowcast. And mm -hmm. we got 27 contributions in total. Yeah. I think this leads us to and how we did it the making of the work yeah. yeah and i'm really resisting talking about <laughs> the details of the imagery that we yeah. captured um i think we could do that in the end if we just do time. that end, yeah but i will say that we received two surprise submissions oh yeah and one is actually an image of the north pole um which yes. you see here stretched across the top but you can expand its station yeah. yeah and you can see here um the submission from barfrost and he has also a qfh antenna set up on the northeasternmost tip of Norway and um, he incredibly imaged almost kind of directly over the North Pole. Yeah. So if you imagine you're holding your antenna or you've got your antenna set up um, as Barfrost did, you're usually vertically in the center of this image that you're seeing here. Um, and in depending on whether the satellite is passing to the east or west of you, you'll be kind of uh, horizontally off center. Um, but yeah, Barfrost was uh, and north enough that, that we can really see the cartographic North Pole there, which yeah. is it's just quite incredible. So if you if you apply yeah. a map overlay, you can see the top of Greenland, <laughs> the sliver of the top of Norway and the top of like uh, Russia and a little bit of China. And it's it's just it's really 
amazing um, yeah and actually what we noticed as well we were kind of confused when we received it because we were thinking like why are the satellite sensors in night mode yeah and <laughs> then we realized of course there would have been very little light when uh, when he created this image um because for us it was i think what it was like 11 a.m or something or sometime yeah 11 a.m in the morning which yeah. for us there would be loads of daylight but for him so close to the north pole there would maybe not be so much light so the the satellite sensors are in like night twilight mode <laughs> <laughs> i think we should now talk yeah. about how we made the yeah. work so I think from this, we're just trying to give a conceptual framing, a feminist framing, tell you about the kind of things that we thought about. Um, we wanted to now sort of unpack the process because for this now cast, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to work with an entirely open source ecosystem. We wanted to um, portray people's field notes and images in a, in a, a different way. Um, and we actually ended up working with an amazing design studio named Rectangle, made up of Lizzie Malcolm and Daniel Powers, um, to work on the level of code to create a new methodology for um, visualizing, georeferencing, map projecting, batch processing, and histogram equalization of NOAA satellite images. So let's we want to take you through some of what that what that meant. Okay, should we begin with the guide? Yeah, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 that's fantastic. Um, so I think I think we can skip through this bit really quickly um, because you've already said that the one of the ways the project began was this kind of um, not really, you know, we, we're not doing something that no one has done before, but we're interested in aggregating knowledge that already existed on um, these forums that are mostly spaces for radio amateurs to chat to each other. So um, this is a guide that uh, was published in June 2020, and it's one of the ways in which I guess uh, we have kind of uh, found collaborators. And, and I don't think we'll go into it here, but it's really set up. So without any prior knowledge of radio or engineering or software, everything should be here for you to get up, set up with a DIY satellite ground station. And we also focused on um, kit that was relatively inexpensive. Uh, so actually, um, the, the kit that we used, oh, that's not true because Sasha used a fun um, cube dongle, dongle pro plus. Well, it's just also there. Yeah, which is it's the expensive version though. I, I always declared <laughs> with the RTL SDR yeah, dongle. Um, and in the antennas that we use are usually a combination of a B dipole that is uh, really cheap and often comes in a kit with the RTL SDR for, for under 50 quid, um, or, or the more kind of um, powerful turnstile antennas. Which is this behind us. Exactly. Um, so I think we're not gonna go into this, um, but we just wanted to let you know the guide is there. Yeah. Um, we and, also, yeah. Yeah, and I just think one, one thing about the guide was we, we did anticipate it would be seen on Public Lab. Um, what was really amazing though was that um, once we published it, a lot of people began to actually replicate it and do it. And if you scroll to the bottom of the guide, there's like 40 comments where people are like asking questions, sharing their own images, sending photos of their antennas. So that was another part that I think we didn't expect was how fast people would kind of take up the guide, try it out. And that was a main way that the network grew between like around May 2020 and the end of yeah, and if, well now basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we're still always receiving feedback and still updating that guide. Yeah. Uh, thanks to also to most recently Bill, who's on the call. Yeah, thanks to Bill Lyles. <laughs> Bill Lyles, just a shout really out. big shout out and thank you to Bill Lyles, who's uh, a radio amateur and a friend of ours and has been really wonderful in um, offering technical advice, close reading our guides, letting us know when something in the guide needs to be updated and just generally, um, being there for us in this project. So I think mm -hmm. we'd like to thank Bill. And I think this is also, I think we, yeah, this is in the tradition or not the tradition, but this is um, one thing, this is kind of really taking on board, I guess, the values of open source coding, but also open source knowledge production. And those are the values that are behind public lab, yeah. the idea that you always share back and that um, you don't just use something, but you comment on it and say how it can be improved. And um, that definitely extended to the kind of the software stack that we um, work to produce for this current now source that as Sasha said, was entirely open source. Mm. 
So this is the the archive. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Sasha, do you want to speak to this? Um, I think there's not too much to say other than that once you so these once you've um, got your DRA satellite ground station set up, and this is kind of open to anyone at any time, um, you can submit to Open Weather um, through uh, what is currently a Google form. Um, if you don't want to log into Google, you can also email us. Um, and then your submission, once we've moderated it, will appear um, in, in our archive that is also currently running off Google Sheets um, and Drive simply because of, um, yeah, constraints, running maintenance costs yeah. um, or a lack of. <laughs> um, so so the, in here, um, if you want to explore, is also, um, yeah, it's also another place where all the content for the Nowcast is being stored. And also when we generate the Nowcast, we pull directly from Google Sheets and the linked files in the drive. Yeah, exactly. Um, also, um, there are often many more images attached to ground stations than we were able to show in the COP26 Nowcast. Mm -hmm. So some people have submitted up to five or six images of their ground stations. So you can also go into this archive directly and look into people's images and see more of who they are. Um, and read their field notes as well. Okay, so I think we're kind of nearing the end now of what we wanted to, yeah, to share. Um, we could talk to uh, the briefly the kind of how we um, could then, you know, compile yeah. the final image. Yeah. Um, and we hope that Rectangle will be able to join us today. Rectangle are Lizzie Malcolm and Dan Powers. And they're long, long time collaborators. Um, we went back to art school together. So um, they, they joined um, us on this really as equal partners to um, work with us so that we can move away from some of the proprietary software that we were using. For example, this software decoder called, uh, sorry, satellite. Um, signal decoder. <laughs> signal decoder. <laughs> it's called um, Wix to Image. That is a fantastic piece of software because it allows you to real time decode um, an image as you receive the satellite transmission, but it's also proprietary, so it's closed source, we couldn't get access to the code, and it's also no longer being maintained. So what we wanted to do and use this, I guess, commission as an opportunity um, to, to achieve was to really strengthen the kind of software ecosystem that we rely on and that we use in our workshops. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at using two different decoders. So Sasha, maybe if you could talk briefly about um, the two, the decoding yeah. and the kind of the final stage of the software stack. Yeah. Um, I can also, um, I, can, I can show briefly, I guess, SDR, but we, we're not gonna run it yeah. for you, but this is, um, this is the, the software defined radio. Yeah. But what I want to do as well is to decode an image for you now yeah. from the archive. So Sophie will, de will live decode an image. Uh, she's gonna pull a WAV file from the archive and go through the process of decoding an image. Uh, will I talk yeah. about the satellite signal decoding software choices? Um, so basically um, there's a lot of satellite signal decoding software around in the, in the ether. There's ones that live in browsers like APT 3000, there's ones that only work on different operating systems, there's ones that are proprietary, ones that are open source. Um, Wix to image was amazing because it not only allowed us to decode the raw images, but it would geo-reference them and it would map project them onto a map of the world. Um, and so we had a problem where we wanted to do that again with this Nowcast, but um, we wanted to use a different tool, so not Wix to image. So we went on the search for an open source satellite signal decoding software that would not only allow us to, again, uh, decode the images, but also put them on a map uh, accurately. So we wrote to Martin Bernardi, um, who um, is a open source coder and a student, I believe he's based in Argentina, because he had made a NOAA APT 1.0. <laughs> No APT 1.3.0. Um, this is the sound of the satellite that Sophie's now playing. So this is the audio recording of the of a NOAA satellite. This is the raw data that we decode to make an image of the ocean space. Um, I would like to point out while we're listening <laughs> that um, what you're hearing, this like ringing tone, 
is a 2400, is the, the 2400 hertz carrier wave that I mentioned earlier. The 2400 hertz carrier wave is what is encoding all the pixel values that makes up a satellite image. The TikTok, this like kind of click ticking you also hear, um, is another frequency, which is the sync. So when you are imagining uh, building an image of Earth, Earth in space, and you imagine the satellite scanning the Earth kind of line by line, you need to know where every line starts. You need to know, uh, yeah, where to kind of sync every line to kind of match up all the pixels. So um, you are hearing actually a satellite image um, through this audio recording. <laughs> Um, so I was saying that we wrote to Martin, and this is Martin's software that Sophie's using right now. And Martin um, has done an amazing thing by, again, making a fully open source uh, de decoder of uh, wave files to make images. But also his software allows you to um, produce a map for every image. So at first we thought, fantastic, we're going to um, kind of use the open source code that Martin wrote um, and use his methodology of both decoding and then dereferencing and map projecting images to generate our now cast for COP26. Um, but it turned out that, and this came out of a conversation with Martin, um, that what Martin software is doing is it's not actually um, map projecting images. It is georeferencing them, but it's actually uh, drawing the map to the image. So in a way that it, the map is kind of, um, it's a kind of vector that gets fit to the image rather than the image being placed on a map. Um, so there's um, something very complex going on there that I, I don't have time to explain, but it basically meant that though we love Martin software and highly respect it, um, it wasn't usable for us for the COP26 Nowcast. However, Martin told us about another open source decoder by someone called Alexander Barth. Um, he is based in Brussels, I believe, and he had written some scripts, so there was no no graphical user interface like you see that Sophie's using right here with Martin's decoder. Barth had written some open source script in a language called Julia. And the script allows you to uh, select a wave file, decode it, um, georeference it, and map project it, or not map project it, geo georeference it. Um, and we took a look at Alexander Barth's code. Um, and although neither I nor Sophie nor Rectangle knew the language Julia, we realized that we could fork his code and make a version with a few other capabilities uh, that would allow us to um, process everybody's wave file recordings, georeference them and map uh, project them. So uh, there was a lot of groundwork in um, this fork. So there's actually a fork on the rectangle GitHub called Open Weather Decoder, uh, which is a fork of, of Barth's software. Um, and it has three basic other, other features, which is that it, it draws on his groundwork in georeferencing images, um, but it also allows us to batch process waves. So in other words, receive a group of waves and process them at the same time. It allows us to map project them onto an equal earth map, very important for us because there's a politics to map projections. And we thought a lot about the map projection that we would choose. And we finally landed on the equal earth map, which was a more fair and equitable projection or as, <laughs> as far as that is possible with a map. Um, and then lastly, um, we, uh, we kind of enhanced the image by increasing the contrast. For us, uh, this allows some of the detail to come out of the images so that you can kind of see more of, of what's going on. Um, that was actually the large majority of the work is just forking this code and getting this methodology working. Um, after that, I think it was more of a question of um, how do we want the Nowcast to look online? What is the interface going to be like? how to, how to um, make palpable people's field notes and documentation alongside the images um, and how to make it like an interactive experience where people can actually explore and zoom and move over the surface of the map. Um, and I think that would be, um, I'm not sure if you wanna say something about what you've just done or do you wanna talk about I, the interface? I think honestly you kind of, you've okay. talked through the decoding there 
Um, we're using Martin's uh, NOAA APT 3.1.1 um, that is also linked. <laughs> 3.1.1 now. No, 1.3. Sorry, yes, Sasha's right. <laughs> um, and um, but I, yeah, I think I'll move away from that um, because that's the software that we use actually during the nowcast to test all the images. But as Sasha said, we we ended up using a different code base um, for the batch processing, histogram equalization, and and map projection. Um, so I think we can just go back to to the now has yeah and 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 I think it's it's possibly time to open up to our collaborators yeah um I think we've I think spoken about the ideas um and decisions behind the production of the yeah. work um and 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 yeah I think I think it'd be great to leave space for questions yeah um and and also it's, it's an opportunity for us actually to potentially talk to some of the people we've been working with who we haven't spoke to since we had two different calls two weeks ago with our core ground stations to prepare for the nowcast yeah. um, that was on Sunday. So yeah, so I think that's a great idea. And um, so we have Joaquin Escura, we have Ankit Sharma and Alison Scott here, um, as, as well as a number of other people actually yeah. we're seeing now from the core ground stations and the, and the wider network. But I wonder if maybe we could start with Joaquin. Uh, Joaquin, do you want to? Uh, we should say that we're not going to pick on people. Apart, yeah. Apart from people who have already said to yeah, us so, that they're really up for speaking. Yeah, so we already so know don't, that. Don't freak. You're on the call <laughs> and we can see you. We know you're there. We're not going to name yeah. you. Yeah, we're, we're not, not going to go to anyone else who said that they would not want to participate. So we're just going to start with Joaquin, maybe. And maybe, Joaquin, just say a few words about yeah, um, how you got involved and what was your experience during the Nowcast? It's so cool to see you. Um, yeah, on this on this call. Yeah, H hello there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I'm super happy to be here. To me, uh, this is actually like a dream come true um, <laughs> uh, to be part of of this movement. Um, and 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 actually, when when I saw the final creation online. And I was browsing through everyone's images. It, it really felt amazing to be part of something bigger. And may, yeah, maybe I just want to say a few words about what happened last Sunday, <laughs> which was like quite cool. So basically, um, uh, for some time now, I've been trying to build uh, an antenna myself, but that didn't go too well. Is because I I was really fixed on the uh, QFH antenna. Um, but I found another radio amateur in Mendoza who gave me a hand with this. And so I had my antenna ready for the Nowcast, which was amazing. And so I went with Amy, my girlfriend, to uh, a nearby national park, which is a very special place. This uh, national park is called Parque Nacional Ciervo de los Pantanos. And it's actually a wetlands region. And to me, uh, and it's near the Parana River, which is the second largest river in Latin America. And it's super important to many, many populations in this part of the world because people um, um, farm, they have the cattle, they use the river to transport things and stuff. And what's happening with this river is that because of mainly uh, climate change, uh, the levels of the water have come down. It's very complex, but it seems that uh, there is like an offset of La Nina that is drying the regions that are far like northern from this part of the world. And so basically this kind of dry weather in like the north of Latin America is making water scarce for this river. So I think that, you know, this is like a very situated, you know, aspect of how climate change is uh, affecting people. It's already happening. Uh, and of course, wetlands are very fragile ecosystems, but they hold most of the biodiversity in the world. So this is why I thought like uh, uh, connecting, tuning with this wider community around the world uh, uh, for the Nowcast uh, in this region was important. And um, basically another thing that happened is that um, it got super windy. Uh, we received a late Sudestada, which 
which is a typical wind from uh, the southeast in the river plate, Rio de la Plata, which is um, actually making the water rise because uh, the Rio de la Plata, as you can see on this image, uh, is the widest river on earth. So if it blows from the southeast, it's so shallow that it produces floods, you know? And so basically as we were there, the wind was becoming like stronger and stronger and we felt quite excited in a way. Um, and in one of the pictures you can see I me like kind of trying to cover the lap because the wind was so strong that it was making like the, the laptop wobble a little bit, you know, and talking about glitches, I had a little problem on one of my cables, you know, these things happen. And one of the images was kind of cut and, and but I realized in time of what was going on, like as the image was downloading and, and so I kind of pushed the cable and everything uh, worked again. And yeah, and uh, I decided to do this uh, tuning to the satellites in silence. I, I really feel excited when I see, uh, hear, you know, this sound uh, of the uh, APT transmission from the NOAA weather satellites. But uh, in this case, you know, as an exercise, I just went 100% visual, no sound cues, just what was going on the so on the software. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Joaquin. Thanks for saying a few words about your experience. And uh, Joaquin and I have known each other for quite a few years now. So really wonderful to have you on this call and in the project. Um, I think there was a nice note about the local wetland deer as well that you thought might be listening in during the, <laughs> during the satellite pass, which is also quite, quite nice. Um, I wonder if you wanna uh, move on to someone else or? Yeah, yeah. I think um, we're almost in the hour, but yeah. Um, we know that there are a few other people who, um, yeah, responded to our invitation to share their, their experiences of participating in the project with us. Um, we, I, I think there is, there's Alison on the call, um, and there's also Ankit. Uh, Ankit and Alison, I think, in, uh, let us know if you'd like to speak, we need to unmute you. Um, I think why, why don't we just to make things simple, why don't we just give Alison uh, the floor and then go to Ankit for, for a couple minutes. If Alison is set up to speak because oh, we had okay. a chat earlier and I know that oh. she just got back from work. We can, oh no, okay. Oh, we can jump okay, in. Sir, she's there. Yeah, you're there. Alison, thank you so much. <laughs> I know that you just got back from work. <laughs> jump to your image on the map. Yeah, no worries. I'm I'm kind of still at, I'm in the lunchroom <laughs> in my work, so I um, find a quiet spot. But um, yeah, thank you. Hello. Um, it's really nice to hear, like from also from the back end, like how what you've been up to, because we've obviously just been doing this like one part of this thing, and you've been yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just be really quick, um, so you can hear from other people. Um. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Glasgow, so I um, yeah, first started doing this sort of, it feels like a practice, this sort of practice um, after getting in touch with Sophie and Sasha um, when I was doing a project in Edinburgh at Collective on Colton Hill, which is an old astronomy observatory. And I was really, in, I was working around the weather and really interested in the kind of crossovers that were there between astronomy and meteorology and um, embodiment of weather so this and yeah all this sort of ideas so it's like just been absolutely mind-blowing and amazing to learn it but um yeah so on the Nowcast day I had a grand plan of like getting a really amazing picture of like being at the river in Glasgow like down where all the cop stuff is happening and it being really like a lovely day but it ended up being really hard to find somewhere in the city that was like open or available or like clear that I could go because lots of parks are closed off and there's quite heavy policing and um, everyone's using every bit of available space so um, I ended up just going to where I normally go and going to like the park um, <laughs> that's right next to my house so that was kind of nice because it's quite far away from all of that um, and it was very rainy um, luckily I had 
I'm uh, an assistant to my partner to like hold on to the umbrellas that were covering my laptop. <laughs> so it was, we must have looked like an absolute sight in the, in the back of, um, of that. So it was quite good fun. And normally it's actually really good to, to, to do that because normally I, I do it when it's like really convenient or like it's a nice day to be out. So it was actually really interesting of like thinking more about like how I was, what I was looking for in the weather and like how, um, what, what, yeah, what that experience would be like. I hadn't done it in rain like that before. So it was really interesting for me. And yeah, just amazing to see everybody else's stuff. So I'll pass on to somebody else. <laughs> That's okay. There's a really nice note in your field note, Alison, where you say that you were uh, interrupted at some point by a lady who was tending her allotment. <laughs> and she's the first asking you, like, what are you doing with this strange <laughs> object in the middle of a cyclonic weather system? <laughs> and you don't hear her at first because you're like, wearing headphones, you don't even know that she's there. And then you kind of get into this conversation with her. And then she's like, well, uh, if, uh, if you wanted to do anything in Glasgow, you would never go outside <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> you want to stay dry. Sorry, you would never go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. it's a good, it's a good uh, motto to live by in Glasgow. Yeah. If you want to stay dry, you, you can't do anything. <laughs> so, yeah. But I think that's also quite nice if I find that people do, cause it does look quite odd. I think if you're in like, especially in the city, then people, um, it's a good conversation starter. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's good. Um, I wonder if uh, Ankit wants to say a few words. Ankit, you are in Mumbai, I believe. So do you want to say a few words about your experience uh, part of this project? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's Ankit from Mumbai. So uh, yeah, I have been receiving uh, NOAA satellites from quite a few time. And um, in Mumbai, uh, here we have, I mean, I live in a residential complex, so we have towers all around. And uh, fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, um, uh, the towers surrounding me are in such a shape that I can only track satellites that are moving on polar orbits. Any other orbits is very difficult for me. I would only get around 30 to 40 degrees of uh, those satellites so fortunately NOAA uh, are polar orbiting satellites and so I got them uh, <coughs> so uh, generally what I do is I generally go at the uh, terrace of my apartment and uh, I seek the permission a day before and take my laptop and go out there. Uh, so uh, my experience of uh, last Sunday was such that uh, I went about in the morning around seven when the pass, pass was and uh, the seven uh, pass was very pleasant. The atmosphere was uh, quite good and uh, the traffic and other uh, things in Mumbai was also quite uh, moderate. But as uh, I got the 10, uh, p uh, 10 a.m. pass, uh, the traffic got a lot uh, more. There was a lot more pollution and even uh, the winds were high as well as um, uh, the things got a lot dusty and it was um, such a dust, uh, dusty wind that, um, I, I, I mean, my laptop was covered with mud <laughs> totally. Uh, and uh, when I actually rubbed my laptop, I was able to see that the uh, mud uh, covering on my uh, hands and um, at the same time, when I came back to my uh, apartment in the, and I rubbed my uh, mouth with uh, the uh, towel, it got, you know, the black marks uh, on it. So it was very dusty out here. And uh, at the same time, the 11, uh, <coughs> 11 a.m. pass was also quite very uh, hot and humid climate uh, with uh, dusty environment. Um, Overall, in Mumbai, uh, previously, uh, we uh, uh, the cyclonic storms were very less. But uh, recently, this year, we faced two cyclonic storms. And um, I, I generally take even the cyclonic storms uh, readings, uh, the NOAA weather uh, forecasting, so cyclonic storms. And um, yeah, so uh, the cyclonic storms have increased as well as the rain, rain pattern. So generally, it rains in uh, August, uh, 
uh, june august and also in october but this year we had a, a dry patch in between so it rained in around may end then there was a big dry patch it was very hot very humid out here and then again it rained um, in uh, october a bit and then uh, the, uh, it has been dry patch till now so it was quite uneven and quite concentrated such concentrated that we had floods uh, out here in mumbai so uh, such rainy pattern is kind of a uh, you know uh, for me as a daily com commuter in mumbai it's it's a big deal for us to face such rainy pattern out here so uh, that that was my experience of uh, naukas as well as uh, weather all over so thank you very much for making me a part of this project thank you yeah, thank, thank you, you for you, being Kate. a part of it it's been and then kate was part of the last now cast as was um joaquin uh so thank you for being part of two now casts actually yeah. at this at this point um, um i just want to say because we were bringing up people's satellite images in the pop-up so you can see the individual submissions but then it's also kind of interesting to to toggle back to the map and particularly with Ankit's submission um, <laughs> well Alison actually got an incredibly long image and you'll see that there is of course there's a cluster of ground stations around northern Europe and three of us captured the same pass and despite the Dreek weather Alison you got <laughs> you got the longest image and Keat um, it's just incredible because the, the three satellites that Ankeep captured um, are all polar orbiting, but all at slightly different latitudes. So and direction and angles as well. And you can see the angles actually when you look down to the um, to the what you can see there is the swath of the satellite. And in these three images um, collage together, um, cover the entire Indian subcontinent. And we can see here the Himalayan shelf um that that uh, area of shadow and also snow so um often the most reflective uh elements in the satellite imagery uh not just cloud but but snow and these are the one way one of the ways in which we um when we're trying to visually locate a satellite image if we don't have the exact time data we'll look for these features and then um we can see here as far as muscat and oman um which is really quite incredible um and down um, furthest um, in the bottom right, you can actually see uh, Bangladesh, and we have we have a submission from Bangladesh. Um, but we also have um, I'm not quite sure actually, as the images are kind of meshed together. Who's we're seeing right now? Probably a combination of the it's two. Bangkok. Bangkok. Oh, sorry, yeah, Bangkok, Bangkok that time. Yeah. Sorry, it's okay. I'm mixing up uh, uh, yeah cities. And here we go. Here's Bangkok. Yeah. But I think I think I can keep your images. We're still seeing your image here, and we can see here the delta um, in Bangladesh really with the river. So there's, and actually in Joaquin's image as well, we can we can see a river. So there's, despite the low resolution in these satellites, because they were launched decades ago, a very low resolution. Um, it's incredible actually what features you can still see from space. Mm -hmm. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> that was a wonderful note to end on. I think. Uh, we should probably, and we would love to just thank everybody who joined the Nowcast, uh, everybody that we worked with before and people that submitted that we didn't know would submit. And we would love to thank uh, John and Ari for mm -hmm. helping us with the Nowcast. John, who prompted us to respond to COP26 um, almost like a year ago. We had conversations almost a year ago about this and it's finally come to fruition and the gallery, of course, and Tabacalera for being in partnership. And it's just been this um, long journey and <laughs> we've, we're still exhausted, but it's just been one of the coolest things I think that we've been involved in, at least I know. It's been the most ambitious yeah. project that we have undertaken yet and probably will for a few years. <laughs> So um, if anybody has any questions, we'd love to take them, John or Sebastian. Uh, yeah, there's, um, in fact, uh, is it a question? Uh, there was uh, Pauline asking if you use any application in the apps to track the satellites, so you know when to collect the data. Yes. So we use a website called N2YO, and it's, a, it's not the best designed site. Um, you'll get lots of ads and pop-ups and stuff, but 
it does do a really good job of synthesizing all the orbits of NOAA 15, 18, and 19. Mm -hmm. um, it also will automatically scrape your uh, location from your computer. Uh, but you can also like change your ground station location by inputting new coordinates. And then really simply, it kind of shows you a, a table uh, for every satellite with the start time of a particular pass, uh, the maximum elevation of that pass, um, and when the pass will end. Uh, and you also can like see it on a map and stuff and see the satellite move over your uh, position. So mm -hmm. um, we use NTYO. We used to use only Wix to Image, the proprietary closed sourced software, mm -hmm. um, which also kind of produces a sort of like table or list of satellite orbits. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess we've kind of used a combination of those two over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that answers that question. <laughs> I'm looking back in the chat and I can see other questions, but they're quite old now. So oh, okay. I think we might have addressed some of them. Thanks so much also from my side. Maybe one question that was posed a, a bit before um, from Mishka Henner, which I'm not sure if he had to leave, but maybe he'll check this in the recording. Um, in any case, it could be also interesting for other people. He was interested in the process of translation when he showed uh, from the wave file, from the sound file to the image. And he wanted to know a bit more about the, the map projection, I think. Okay. So the translation process, I will do a quick uh, explanation. I should say I've learned most mm -hmm. of this from Bill Lyles, um, who I've had the pleasure of working with on, I guess, another forked decoder uh, that I won't talk about now. But so basically, um, in very simple terms, the 2400 hertz carrier wave, imagine it like a wave, right, kind of moving through space. 2400 hertz means 2400 cycles per second. Now, the distance between these wave peaks, uh, the kind of peaks of every wave is the same. It, it stays the same, but the height or the strength of those peaks can change. And that's called amplitude modulation. When you change the kind of height of the wave peak in response to a certain kind of data. Um, so very, very basically, um, we, which everybody will know because of AMFN. I would say, yeah, I'm letting, Sasha is a teacher, so well, she does the best explaining, but I would just say that. <laughs> Make an analogy. Yeah. AM. Yeah. Well, AM, AM radio. Yeah. AM, you yeah. will know amplitude mod modulation and frequency modulation through old radios, yes. AM, FM radio. So all we're doing here with software defined radio yeah. is repeating those processes. Exactly. So Sasha, AM, yeah, so AM, just a way of encoding information into a carrier wave. That information could be sound, it could be voice, it could be data. So it's just a way of encoding information into a carrier wave. Now, I was saying that there are different wave heights, different signal, different strengths basically of, of these waves, even though they, the wave peaks are the same distance apart. And basically these, um, the kind of heights or the, the, the values that are these wave peaks um, can be mapped to pixel values. So on a scale from zero to 255, from, from white to, to black. It's more complex than that because um, we're not actually extracting every single wave peak and mapping it onto a pixel value. Uh, there's things to do with the sample rate of the wave file. There's things to do with the actual amount of units of information that we know that NOAA is transmitting to us because there's uh, 10,040 uh, units of information in every line of the satellite image, which NOAA actually calls words, 10,040 words per every line. And that means that we have to extract 10,040 words or values from these amplitude modulated uh, peaks and uh, dips in this carrier signal. Now, interestingly, there's a lot of different demodulation methods that allow you to do this. So there are some very kind of simple methods where you just kind of zero out the negatives of the frequency, take the absolute value, and then you're going to get those uh, wave peaks, right? There's other methods where you use, there's something called the cosine method. Um, there's also, also something called the Hilbert function. Uh, which is the most precise method of extracting that information encoded in the 2400 hertz carrier signal. Um, I, yeah, so I think like, I'm not gonna go into more detail because that's already a lot, but basically we are extracting 
the amplitude modulated information encoded in a 2400 hertz carrier signal. And that information can be mapped onto pixels and it can be synced in lines. Um, and uh, I think I should leave it there. I think I've forgotten the second question. What was the second question? <laughs> the map. The map. The map. You wanted to. I think we already spoke about the map. Right. We went. We actually. Um, it took. It, to making the projection in equal Earth projection was not was not <laughs> easy. So so we did actually invest a lot in uh, moving away from products like Mapbox that always use the Makeda projection. Yeah. Um, and last now class we used the Eckhart. Four yeah. projection. This time we really wanted to be um, intentional in every step we took from the software defined radio to the decoder to the projection itself. So this is why we decided to team up with open source coders yeah. so that we could um, have kind of as much control as possible over the representation of the image. Um, and, and we arrived at Equal Earth, but you'll see that the geo referencing isn't perfect. So it yeah. doesn't quite map on. You can tell at points. It's um, particularly, I guess, around the equator, it's a little bit better as you get to the tip of South America, it's quite off. But that's because the georeferencing that we were using for the decoder was is, is imperfect. Mm. Um, but we still preferred that open source DIY approach over a closed source proprietary, so costly software package. Yeah. And I think a lot of this is unblack boxing a process that most of the time, like you don't you don't see in this world. So a lot of these signal de de decoding softwares, you you input a wave file, it outputs an image, and you have no idea, you know, um, what demodulation method it used, what where where it began the 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 uh, sync, um, how it was mapping those pixels. Um, so we're really trying to kind of yeah un un black box all the steps in this process and make it open source and make mm -hmm. it available for others and that goes from the decoding and the wave file recording through to the map projecting and the mm -hmm. interface design. Yeah, um, and I'll just add. I see there's one question in the chat, but um, and I know actually John is moderating the chat, but <laughs> um, the this is something that is that that black boxing the knowledge of what is actually happening in the process of the capture, reception and decoding of the satellite image. That is something that even my colleague in the team that I work in, who is a trained geospatial analyst, actually, yeah, no, I won't say, <laughs> um, uh, highly trained. And, um, and, and for her, like seeing this project, I think it's really, it's, it's just something completely different from the work that she does. And she was kind of, I think, confused and amused that I was receiving satellite images from my bedroom during the lockdown as 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 it's you know like yeah is, is that is not um it, it's really an amateur practice that we're drawing on not necessarily a professional practice and those professionals don't necessarily even know or would know how yeah. to receive and decode an image so it, it's quite fascinating in that respect uh, in fact, I didn't want to bring up not the last question, but a comment before. Uh, Fabi, I uh, was saying that uh, so much inspiring work on methodologies, excited to begin my own antenna build and incorporate these processes into my dance practice. Uh, I was lucky enough to be present at the, at the roof of the Photographs Gallery on Sunday to capture the, the image. And I did experience a little bit like the performatic aspect of the process. Uh, and I was I thought that it might be interesting also for have me to, to know a little bit more about it, if you could expand a little bit about how uh, the movement of the body is involved and unrelated to in the process of, of capturing the image. Yeah, that of course, um, and it's it's not something that yeah we've actually thought about this quite a lot, and we've actually we we did have a sort of idea one moment to collaborate with a dancer or a dance group yeah. um, to make a performance work with Noah imagery. Um, so um, it depends what kind of antenna you're using, but certainly if you're using a turnstile antenna like the one behind us that John you used with us on Sunday. Um, you need to, uh, as Sophie was saying earlier, point it in the direction of the satellite um, because the satellite signals are uh, coming from the satellite in straight lines, basically, um, and they are direct, direct directional um, signals. So that means that you need to um, hold the antenna and you need to know where the satellite is coming from, so above which horizon 
what its elevation will be at the midpoint, um, when it will set. Um, I'm saying all this, but in practice, it's like you have this metal object, you're pointing it at a horizon, and you have to like kind of listen, sense, use your body, feel, uh, look at the imagery loading live, and imagine the satellite orbiting above you all at the same time and where you are makes a big difference so if you're again as uh, um, Pete was saying if you're in the middle mm -hmm. of a city um trying to peek through the the cracks between buildings if you're in an open field it makes a very big difference um but they're very there definitely is something very dance-like and choreographic about this um and so one of our ideas at one point was to collaborate with dancers to use the antennas in ways that are kind of more experimental or mm -hmm. speculative or playful than uh, what we know how to do without being trained dancers and mm -hmm. um, and see what kind of noise we can choreograph into the image and what kinds of forms of disruption we can create and what kinds of different textures we can create, um, like using dance as a platform in relation to this satellite signal mm -hmm. decoding. Does that, does that make any sense? I think I'm, my, my brain is like, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a, it's a great question and um, John and Ari uh, were on the roof with us in the photographer's yeah. gallery and we were doing a lot of kind of pointing to the invisible orbit of the satellite which is you know our kind of line of sight to it from the rooftop um, and and looking at you know where north was so that we could we could like align ourselves with where we thought the satellite would be mm. and tracking it over I think it was probably in the sky for about 10 minutes but yeah, the way we move mm -hmm. is not the way a choreographer would necessarily um, understand movement yeah. or a dancer would move with intention. So, so we were really interested in exploring that aspect of the work. And while these satellites are still in orbit that are analog as well, because mm -hmm. once we lose the analog satellites and we have to start receiving digital satellites, that um, interference that can be written into the image because of the analog signal, that won't be possible anymore yeah um so so yeah yeah so there so, yeah. is a time constraint a little bit on working with NOAA satellites um so i think we have one last question that was uh, left in the chat from before from sun who asked uh, more information about um i think i guess a bit more technical questions again on the wave file what information it includes beside the weather image um, and if it does include more information, how you sample specific wave files for decoding? Uh, okay, so this is um, the wave file includes other. Um, okay, the wave file, yes, the answer is yes. So um, actually, <laughs> I did a satellite pass with my students this morning because. I was too tired to make a lesson plan for the two seminars I had to teach at Royal Holloway this morning. So I said, I offered them to do the satellite pass and talk about it. And so um, I was talking with them about this. So basically when you see the raw images, if we could go back to a raw image. We, yeah, um, oh no, we don't, yeah, okay. okay. So basically we were showing these raw images and there were these two channels of data basically, but in the middle there are these notches and these kind of like uh, other gray and black lines. And these notches are marking the number of minutes. So if you count the number of notches, that's how many minutes are encoded in the satellite image in the wave file. Um, they also include uh, image uh, info on, uh, yes, exactly, on the kind of movement of the satellite itself. Um, they include sensor. So if there's, you wanna say the thing about the sensor? Aim at um, the darkness of space. This is something we just found out though, so I don't think I can. <laughs> it's I mean, great we though. don't know everything. Yeah. But um, you know, the, the black and whites are also obviously used in the histogram equalization. Yeah. And they also tell us which sensors are switched on. So during the day, um, there's a visible light channel and there's also an uh, infrared channel. At night, um, of course, there's no visible light, you know, which is um, a channel that is, of course, reliant on reflection. Um, we only are getting that infrared information that is absorbed um, energy that is being uh, radiated back towards the satellite. So at night, uh, we actually have two infrared channels. Mm. And you can tell because these notches that Sasha were talking about, that actually in many ways, you know, they are the key to kind of the duration of the image. They also mirror, I suppose, the, I guess, Sprockets is the one, the, the John and this photographer's gallery would notice that the holes in the in the edge of a film 
Um, and when you're using, you know, like a 35 mil film, say, um, for me, at least like uh, having uh, studied photography at school, like this, it was immediately that kind of, I don't know, mm. reminiscent of a film reel. Mm. Um, John, what are the holes called? Uh, I don't know. I mean, unfortunately, I don't know it in English. <laughs> I know how um, to, yeah, I know how to say it like uh, in Spanish, but not in English. But anyway, I think that we we know what what you are talking about. Yeah. So yeah. so I guess um um there's a lot of information in there as well. A sprocket. It is. Bill, Bill, right. it is thank you, Bill. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Confidence. <laughs> yes. Um. So so yeah, you're really seeing this duration. I imagine you're also seeing. Um, visually, you can just at a quick look, glance tell which sensors are switched on during the day. One of those lines will be black and the other one will be white. The visible light channel or is actually kind of near infrared will be black and the far infrared channel will be white. At night, both of those turn to white. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, and there's other information there that, in there that um, can also be um, extracted through different ways of processing which are often called enhancements so you can look at sea temperatures you can look at cloud top temperatures um, that can tell you about the energy of weather systems mm. um, and, and there's different basically ways in which the images can be rendered to draw out those different um, the, the different information um, within them yeah. um, as well as what Sasha said the very technical information that allows for the syncing and the decoding of the image into a visual format that can we can interpret. Yeah and then the second part of this question about sampling the wave file for decoding I sort of talked a little bit about that uh, earlier when I was talking about the 2400 hertz carrier wave um, so if we know if we know the number of words in every line of a satellite image, which is what NOAA tells us it has sent us, if we know the sample rate of the wave file, if we know the frequency of the carrier signal and how much information is encoded in that, we know how often we need to sample that wave file recording to produce the pixels we need for an image. And I think I should just leave it there because um, honestly, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And uh, mm -hmm. I think, um, but I think one, one thing about, for example, working with Bill has been um, forking a version of an open source decoder. So Bill and I forked something called APT3000, which is an open source decoder. And we basically made it so that you can choose um, what kind, like where your sync starts, you can choose what kind of demodulation method you would like to use. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can choose between like the very simple method or the Hilbert function or the cosine method. You can apply different kinds of contrast. Um, so again, a lot of this thinking around um, signal processing and the wave files mm -hmm. has come out of this desire to unblack box these tools and to kind of unpack them and make them uh, teaching tools also and make them available for our students. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe in the workshop on November 13th, we might take a look at this uh, open source version that Bill and I um, sort of worked on together, and we might mess around with that uh, a little yeah. bit. Uh, yeah, Ari has just uh, shared also more like the link to to the workshop, just in case you you want to take a look. Um, and I think that uh, we are good, maybe to to wrap up. I know that you are exhausted about like a long. <laughs> uh weekend of of work uh with an outcast um yeah just thank you uh, to both of you and to all the, the open weather network of people uh, in different parts of the of the world as well as to rectangle for for their work uh, on the on the project uh thank you to everyone who has joined here uh today um maybe a reminder no marco about our next screen work. Yes, also thank you so much from my side. I think it's been uh, so much super inspiring <laughs> and interesting stuff. And you have been able to explain all of these layers so well. I am I'm, uh, really impressed. And especially on behalf of the screen work spirit, also this idea of reclaiming this image space through a global network community it's been fantastic and also thanks to all the extended community of participants who joined and you know became kind of also part of, of this community in, in Zoom tonight. Um, yeah, we are back in two weeks with uh, Mark Lee, um, who is actually going to talk about again the planet, but seen through um, the eyes of uh, people who take pictures of 
plants and animals and how he brings together this other vision that somehow feels like a good follow up from, from this uh, um, um, satellite vision. Um, and we are back on the, what is it, the 22nd? It's on the 17th of November, right? in two weeks from now. <laughs> I'm also exhausted. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's maybe go for the traditional and mute all. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to, to just uh, communicate with each other. And thank you so much again, everyone, to, for joining us. Uh,